It's my privilege now to introduce Dr. Peter Ballerstad. Um, Peter, Peter got his bachelor and master's degree at the University of Georgia. We're in, we hold that in common, Peter, and got his PhD from the University of Kentucky in 1986, specializing in forage management and utilization. Peter has extensive experience in forage agriculture. He was the forage extension specialist at Oregon State from 86 through 92. He's been with Baron Brug USA since 2011, first as their forage product manager until 2018 and currently as their forage ambassador. And as Peter talks, you'll get an understanding of why he is their forage ambassador. Peter is also the current president of the American Forage and Grassland Association. So that organization is really the chief sponsor of this meeting, providing a lot of the manpower um, of this meeting. So Peter will represent both being a forage ambassador and being the president of the AFGC. Peter is an advocate for ruminant animal agriculture and the essential role of animal source foods in the human diet. He strives to build bridges between producers and consumers and researchers across a wide variety of scientific disciplines. Peter has spoken at many different events in the US and internationally. Many of his presentations are available on YouTube. Peter and Nancy live in Western Oregon with their three dogs, Connor, Noni, and Iris. Peter, we welcome you to the podium. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith, and thank you all for coming. Howdy, everybody. Uh, we're going to have to work on your enthusiasm. So yes, on behalf of the American Forage and Grassland Council and the program committee members who've worked to host this meeting, thank you very much for making the effort to attend. I want to use grasslands in two ways. I want to talk about the biome and its role in the world of 2050, as well as this organization and its role in the world of 2050. And so our theme is grassland for soil, animal, and human health. This isn't a new concept. This goes back to the very beginning. Professor Falta made this comment about feeding a population of a country is by itself, a country by itself is the basis of public wealth, productivity, and general well-being. Sort of sounds like maybe even national security is involved here. Well, there's some interesting times that we live in. Three quarters of U.S. residents who are between the age of 17 and 24 are not eligible for service because of weight, because of drug use, because of legal issues. The biggest one of those is the weight. Overweight and obesity has become a national security issue in the United States. So that's a challenge <laughs> between now and 2050. You know, it occurs to me as I look at 27 years from now, you have to keep updating that slide, right? Because the years go by, it keeps getting closer. Well, I'm not going to be around based on actuarial tables, but today's young students or young professionals, it will still be within their professional lifetimes. Serving grassland agriculture, well, I will use that term to encompass all those that Dr. Smith listed. So what is this world going to look like? Well, various people have made pronouncements about the world population will reach more than 9 billion people. That they'll, we'll need to double world food production. Okay, some of that may come from eliminating food waste, significant issue, but we're going to have to produce more food. And it's going to have to be higher quality food. So they're projecting an increase of 66%, two-thirds increase in the demand for animal protein. I'm here to tell you that that's an underestimate, but we can talk throughout the week if you're interested. 
Most of that must come from the same land area that we have now. We're not making more cropland or very minor, and there's some issues that we'll get into later. 70% of humanity will live in urban areas by 2050. So this is a global issue now. What we've seen in the United States over the last 100 years, we will see globally over the next 27. And we're going to become an increasingly aging population. As, the, as, as Europe becomes the oldest population in the world, what is that going to mean? Most of humanity, including 66% of global children, will live in the tropical region of the world. That's only about a third of the land mass. What's that going to mean? Future of humankind depends deeply on understanding, managing, and sustaining grasslands from the 2013 conference. I'm not interested in sustaining humanity. I'm interested in increasing flourishing of humanity. I love this quote because it starts off with, I don't have to tell any of you, and then it continues. Well, okay, we've been talking to ourselves, but I can assure you we need to talk to the 98% of the American population that doesn't understand what you do and why that matters. So what? What's your elevator speech for answering why is this important? But we have some really good news, and part of what I hope we can do is find ways for the Grasslands Congress to start making itself better known, making the work we're doing better known, because I think it's really important. So they say, we don't have to, I don't have to tell you. Well, there are people we need to tell. Let's imagine, just for a second, that the Earth's surface land area is a soccer field, OK? Now, there's a whole lot of people in the world that don't know the difference between agricultural and arable land. Now, I don't have to tell you. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> but if you were to imagine all the agricultural land, it wouldn't even make it to the center circle. That's agricultural land. The arable land would only make it to the penalty spot within that penalty area. And as my friend Dan Glenn said, yeah, the spot's getting closer and the goalie's getting nervous. We're losing arable land globally. And so whatever people are proposing about eating more of these human edible crops has to come from the arable land, not the non-arable. And then we have the problem of the either or. Of course, livestock agriculture is thoroughly integrated with agriculture, crop agriculture, for lack of a better phrase. <clears throat> the vast majority of the biomass produced by agriculture is not human edible. How are we going to make use of that? One study out of Europe suggested that for every kilo of vegan food, four to five kilos of inedible biomass were produced. So we have this necessary integration of livestock into our cropping systems, and of course they look different around the world. Well, the good news is there's this growing interest in soil health, and it gives us a natural in, and, and this results in people getting very interested in various things, some of which are well-founded or better founded than others, but it gives us an opportunity to build bridges. And of course, we can point to the essential role of forages, I'm sorry, cover crops, I'm sorry, <clears throat> within these systems or livestock or rotations. These are not new concepts. And this is a key point I want to make. This, this quote goes back to 1908. When our soils are gone, we too must go unless we can find some way to feed on raw rock. Well, in a sense, we are, right? I mean, we're mining phosphate and we're feeding it, but not the way he meant it. So 1908, what, what has happened 
that this is not better known. Here's another one uh, from the Yearbook of Agriculture, 1938, Mr. Kellogg, a name I usually don't try to cite, uh, but that's another story. Essentially, all life depends upon the soil. There can be no life without soil and no soil without life. They have evolved together, 1938. Not new, maybe poorly communicated, Grassland is a good way to farm and to live, the best way I know of to use and improve soil, the very thing on which our life and civilization rest, 1948. Not new. What, what's happened? How, how can we do better going forward? How can we let others know that what we're doing? Because I've found myself integrated into communities of disciplines outside of agriculture that are really interested in what you're doing. How can we build bridges? I think I have an answer and I'll get to it. So grassland agriculture, as Dr. Smith mentioned, is many facets. Um, and here are just a few that I listed. Conservation ecosystem services, cover crops and soil health, integrated livestock cropping systems, agroforestry, in addition to pasture rangeland, hay, and silage. But ultimately, it's this inedible biomass that we can run through, primarily ruminants, and produce highest quality food for humans, as well as other services, as well as ecosystem services. <clears throat> I have heard it stated that our grasslands are our most endangered biome globally. Something like 50% of our temperate grasslands and 16% of our tropical grasslands have been converted already into cropping or into urban development. Well, we, we got a little head start on the rest of the world. <laughs> um, we've got almost 80% of our prairie has been converted. Arguably one of our greatest natural resources is the basis of the Corn Belt. And our subsequent stewardship has resulted in degradation of soil and some other issues. Not casting blame, I understand how we got here, but this is just the reality when we start looking around the rest of the world. The good news is that we can have healthy people and healthy soils thanks to ruminant animal agriculture. You know this, how do we tell the rest of the world this? Grassland science, which is deeply connected to food production, land utilization, and environmental conservation, is charged with the heavy responsibility of being a science for human existence. Again, I want to I emphasize flourishing, because it is by fostering human flourishing, it is by maximizing human flourishing, that we will get to minimizing human impact. Plus, I just think it's an, a moral imperative. <clears throat> but notice food production. Is all food equivalent? If all you're interested in is producing calories per acre, grow sugar cane. You grow a lot of calories. And of course, we're dealing with a culture that is poorly informed, let me just put it that way. And so this is a culture where it's important for us to let them know which end of this wondrous structure the enteric methane comes out of. Let alone when we go on to something like emphasizing the indispensable, the digestible indispensable amino acid scores of foods because most of these conversations are still treating protein, whether it comes from plants or animals, on an equivalent mass basis, and that is completely inappropriate. But we can't do that in sound bites. We have to find better ways to communicate. And when we start looking at some of these impacts and we use better tools, we find that the conversation changes completely. This is from the IPCC itself, the latest assessment that they say that we ought to be estimating the global warming potential of enteric, that is from the rumen methane, 
by the global warming potential asterisk star GD, GWP star instead of GWP 100, which is what has been used. And what they estimate is that, according to this, it, they've been overestimating the impact of enteric methane by about three to four times and underestimating the impact of methane from fossil fuels by that same factor. So that might change the conversation a little bit. And here's a paper that hasn't yet reached press, but I saw it, the, the researcher report this at a meeting last week. Basically, they're estimating that the impact of enteric methane in beef cattle systems in the United States has been overestimated by approximately 12.2 times. That seems like that might be significant. But what do I know? I'm just an agronomist. What would that do to change the conversation? Have we been talking about the right thing? I'm here to suggest that we haven't. It's not that it's not important. I'm just concerned that we've been distracted. Simple fact is sustainable food systems require livestock, full stop. We can defend this. This is, need not be controversial. And here's a concept that you cannot replace food production with food processors that when we upcycle forage fiber and cell contents through the wonder, the miracle of a ruminant animal, we are creating highest quality, nutritionally speaking, food for humans out of a resource that was not human edible. When we take grains or pulses or nuts and we process those, we're taking something that is, all right, human edible, and we're processing it into a product, and I don't know of any process that's 100% efficient. So we're not increasing the food supply at all. In fact, we're decreasing it. And many times that processing reduces the nutritive value of the highly processed product. And we haven't yet applied the appropriate qualitative tools to accurately assess, okay? And when we look at the impacts of those, there was recently a, a, a report that suggested lab-grown meat might actually be 25 times worse in its climate impact than beef. And it is nowhere close, well, depending on what we're talking about. Okay, but I digest, let me go on. I do have to pay attention to time, oh my goodness. Okay. So a critical idea I want people to get is that you can be overfed but undernourished. Okay? And maybe what we eat influences what we eat. Malnutrition today looks a little different than when I was a young boy. Today we have, and again, these are still pre-pandemic figures, although they were more recently released. Uh, over 800 million are calorically undernourished. That's sort of the stereotypical, you know, starvation. But we've got 2.6 billion that are overweight or obese. This is all malnutrition. Undernutrition is not synonymous with caloric deficit. Too many people think it is. And protein energy malnutrition is by far the most lethal form of malnutrition. Children are the most impacted. Uh, globally, under five years old, over half are deficient in certain micronutrients that are essential for proper brain development, which is a lifetime decrement for them. Uh, we have nearly a quarter of children under five years old being stunted. This is not merely stature, it involves brain development. This has a massive impact on economic development potential. This is taking a human being and limiting their God-given potential because they're not fed properly. Nearly a qua oh, sorry, um, we have 7% that are wasted. That's a small weight to height issue, and 6% are overweight. 
Often we're seeing these in the same populations. Uh, U.S. adults, 60% uh, of U.S. adults live with at least one chronic disease, 40% have two or more. Um, this is a cost, it's 90% of the annual health care expenditures, which is estimated to be $4.1 trillion. What could we do with $4.1 trillion? Could we get some work done? Could we make the case that it's better to put it on the front end? Do, do anybody here in animal husbandry and herd health, and your herd health begins with nutrition? Like it's a bad idea to try to treat your way out of poor nutrition? Yet that's what public health is based on for humans. Uh, globally, 73% of global deaths are due to these chronic, metabolic, therefore nutritional disorders. 60% of the global burden of disease, um, that's only 47 trillion by 2030. What could we do with 47 trillion dollars? I'm not saying eliminate health care. But I'm saying building more of what, okay, never mind, sorry, got to keep going. Um, again, global in scope, half of the people, see this is, the, this is fundamentally the result of insulin resistance and chronically elevated insulin. This is the unifying theory of, chro of chronic disease. Half of the adults in China, India, and USA have this. So 80% live in low and middle income countries. There's this myth that this is the result of prosperity. It's key to remember that obesity is a symptom, it's not the cause, and too often it's treated as if it is. And so then we can find people like the former governor, um, director general of the World Health Organization, and the best she can do is describe obesity and diabetes as a slow motion disaster. Like we don't know what to do about this, but we can just see the train running into the station too high a speed. Well, there are others who are suggesting, as I just mentioned, that there's a, a root cause. And I don't know if you can read the list of diseases, but cancer and circulatory diseases, gastrointestinal dis diseases, endocrine disorders, nervous disorders, skeletal disorders, urinary disorders, virtually every chronic disease that you can name has some significant linkage, if not causal relation, to chronic, to hyperinsulinemia and, and, and uh, insulin resistance. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, let's get personal. Are you part of the 12 or are you part of the 88? Okay, what does that mean? Only 12% of adult Americans enjoy optimal metabolic health. And that's whether they have ideal body weight or not. Because see, weight's a bad metric. Okay, what do you mean, 88, 12? Okay, so you don't have optimal cardiometabolic health if you have abdominal obesity, and there's different metrics for men and women. Biology isn't fair. You have different uh, elevated serum triglycerides, elevate, uh, depressed HDL cholesterol, the so-called good cholesterol, a uh, blood pressure that's elevated, fasting blood glucose that's elevated, or you're taking medications for any one of those. If you have one of those, you don't have optimal cardiometabolic health. And I'm here to tell you that if that's true for you, please, please, please look into therapeutic carbohydrate restriction or reduction. Uh, it's well established in the literature. There are professional organizations I'm happy to introduce you to. Um, by the way, a, car a reduced carbohydrate diet is one that's going to not restrict animal source foods. Uh, but I can't use that slide anymore <laughs> because a more recent estimate is that it's, nine, it's only 7% of adult Americans have optimal cardiometabolic health, and this is still pre-pandemic da uh, data. I don't think our response to the pandemic made this any better. So borrowing from Dr. Hancock's presentation at an alfalfa conference, this slide, that where there is no vision, there is no hope. So on the one hand, we have the slow motion disaster. I'm here to offer a different vision. And just as we had Professor Borlaug and his colleagues with a green revolution, 
and a man who is said to have saved a billion people from starvation when that was a quarter of humanity, we now have 40% of 8 million people in the world that are suffering from malnutrition. We need a ruminant revolution. Okay, come up with your own title. Come up with your own program. I know I'm not that clever, I think I am, but you know, come on, let's work on this. Because I guarantee you that there are people who are interested. We just have to build bridges. The quote, I personally cannot live comfortably in the midst of abject hunger and poverty and human misery. There's still a billion people in the world that have no access to electricity. There's still like two billion people in the world that burn dirty biofuels, including a billion that burn dung. You want to talk about circular economy? What's happening to the nutrients in the dung they burn, let alone the particulate pollution and the respiratory disease that causes? But again, I digest. So I envision the central role of grassland congresses as that of assisting scientists working in specialist areas to conceptualize their work in wider interdisciplinary context. We need to stop building silos and start building lighthouses. There are people who are really interested, but they don't know you exist. So these are just some suggestions that I would offer of some multidisciplinary things. Uh, and I really, really hope that we can start some conversations that will lead into 2027 for our 100th anniversary. There are people today that are working to achieve drug-free remission of type 2 diabetes. If the average adult American with type 2 diabetes could eliminate their medication use, that would lower their carbon footprint 29% more than if they shifted from a high meat to a vegan diet. Nobody stays on a vegan diet. They're not sustainable. See, there's many definitions to sustainable. We need to use them all. So. In October, I was given the, the honor of moderating the environmental section of the Glo Dublin Summit on the role of meat in society. And there's a Dublin Declaration, if you take a picture if, with your, you know, cam your phone, uh, of the QR code over farthest away from me, that will get you to a document called the Dublin Declaration of Scientists. And you can read that, and if you feel like you can support that as a scientist, please sign. They are only accepting people who have credentials, and they're trying to just get the message out that there are many well-qualified people who have this opinion that, that meat has an essential role in society, whether that's in its production, its sale, its consumption, the ecosystem services, etc. cetera. Uh, last time I checked, I think they've passed over a thousand signatures now. The QR code that's closest to me is the latest edition of the Animal Frontier, and it has the papers that came out of that Congress. So what can we do? What can the Congress do? What might we catch as a vision from this? Or do you just disagree with everything I said? That's OK. We can disagree without being disagreeable. Let's figure out how to do this, because there will be no sustainable development if we don't deal with the issue of chronic illness. Your approach may be different than mine, but let's talk about it. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you again for coming. I'm here to tell you that what you're doing is the most important thing that we can be doing. We just need to let more people know what we're doing. Thank you.